So they put me on these very expensive biologic drugs. The drug was called Remicade mm. and it cost, I would get an, a blood infusion every eight weeks and each infusion cost $50,000. Damn. So luckily, you know, had really good insurance, but you know, four, $400,000 per year. And they, you know, they tell you that you're going to be on these meds for the rest of your life yeah. because there's no cure. Hello, friends. Welcome back to the show. We have an incredible conversation today with Brett and Harry from the Meat Mafia. Expect to learn about overcoming ulcerative colitis, taking the leap from corporate America into podcasting, and what Brett and Harry have learned along the way by interviewing some of the brightest minds in the fields of nutrition and mindset. We also have a really cool conversation about how to make health fun and not take it so seriously sometimes. We then dive into our live callers where we learn about swollen fingers, liver jerky, and high cholesterol numbers with an animal-based diet. And before we get into the show, a quick favor to ask of you. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, please like, subscribe, and leave us a review. It massively helps us spread this message of radical health. And without further ado, let's dive into the show with the Meat Mafia. Hello, friends. Welcome back to the show. We've got a very uh, special and exciting podcast today. I'm joined by Brett and Harry from the Meat Mafia. How are you doing, guys? It's good to have you on the show. Is there a better place to be than Heart and Soil HQ? No, it's one of our favorite spots in Texas. <laughs> We're pumped to be back here. We came out here... I think what was it like three, four months ago for yeah. the first time? And we were like, this is incredible. People are shirtless. You guys are growing <laughs> steaks. It's we're like, can we live here? Yeah. yeah. How good is that? I'm I'm a little partial and biased too, but I love it. Every time I get to come out and do this trip, I'm excited. It feels really good. And it feels extra special today to be joined by you two guys who are making big waves in the podcasting world. So I want to hear about your individual stories, but I also want to start with a congratulations mm. on your one year birthday of the Meet Matthew podcast. You guys have been at it. You've produced a hundred and 60 episodes in that process mm. you've left jobs and pursued this thread of what's alive in you and all of that stuff so before we dive into your individual backstories tell us a little bit about meat mafia where'd the name come from why the duo how you guys connected what's the big why there just kind of the floor is yours tell us a little bit about that because it's very impressive what you guys have been up to thank you um you want to start us off because you started with clemenza so it's sure for you to kick it off yeah and thank you for the compliment i think it's just like a kind of a testament like getting to this year mark and doing a 157 episodes in that time frame it's just like a testament to kind of getting lost in the process of creating something that you actually truly love mm -hmm. and we both didn't really know what we were going to do with the podcast at this time last year it was in the early days i think we'd probably released like three or four episodes but we started this whole idea of the meat mafia with pretty low expectations. Mm -hmm. We had both quit job or I had quit my job. Brett was still working. We had finished this Ironman race and we were living together. And it was very clear that we had similar passions around health and that we hadn't fully tapped into like our ability to give this information that we had for ourselves to other people. Mm -hmm. So we started writing online December of 2022 yeah. or 2021. Sorry. And, um, we started writing online kind of about the convergence between what was happening in the food system and how that affects our health as individuals. Mm. And so that was like us kind of just like breaking the mold, like taking this like skin off and taking a step into a world that we really were very uncomfortable and unfamiliar with. Mm -hmm. We hadn't been creators before we had worked corporate jobs and this is our first little experiment with like, Hey, let's start putting some stuff out mm -hmm. there. And pretty quickly within like a matter of like six to eight weeks, we were going from like hundreds of followers to thousands of followers on Twitter. And this idea of the meat mafia was kind of loose at the time. Like I remember mm -hmm. or the original name of our podcast was the playing with fire podcast. Okay, cool. Like the first two right. episodes, if you listen, it's, we, we call yeah, it the playing with fire podcast. And we leaned into the meat mafia because we had just created these aliases online yeah. that we were writing through. And um, the writing led us to the podcast. And then the podcast has just been, I think our creative, um, love and passion. Like we've just loved having these conversations with, yeah. with people and learning more about their stories, sharing our experience. So, um, you know, that's kind of the quick recap. I don't know if I missed anything there, buddy. But. No, it was a, it was a great recap. I think a lot of it is like the whole meat mafia brand is kind of an extension of our friendship and our perspective on nutrition. Yeah. I think first and foremost, we don't consider ourselves to be experts. We're just enthusiasts and we're two people that 
have had our own experience with diet and lifestyle really being like a preventative cure and had our own amazing experiences. And, you know, we were kind of sitting here after this Ironman race that we did, we got out of the Northeast and we said, I think we have a good perspective on nutrition. Mm -hmm. That's very simple. Things are so complicated mm -hmm. now. It's so tough to get accurate information or you, you know, you follow one person that says something competing to another person. Yeah. We're like, why don't we just start sharing some information and just see if people resonate with it. And, you know, now we're sitting here, like you had mentioned, almost 170 episodes in, you know, 150,000 followers on Twitter. And I'm not saying that to be boastful. I'm just saying I think a lot of people underestimate what they can do in a year with the right applied yeah. force and applied energy because this literally didn't exist this time last year. That's so good, man. There's a quote that says something like, you know, people overestimate what they can do in a week and underestimate what they can do mm -hmm. in a year. And that's exactly what you were describing, right? I think if you find something you're passionate about and you just let it consume you and it just becomes what you're doing. To your point, you know, as well, not sitting here as the, you know, the, the authority or the expert mm -hmm. that is all knowing, but is just sharing through experience and telling stories. Yeah. I think like there's something really powerful about that. You connect with other people when you tell your story, when you share your story, give other people permission to believe that they can get healthy too. And I know you guys have backstories individually that are quite interesting as well with your own health struggles. Mm -hmm. There's a reason and kind of I feel that we all arrive at this kind of keto carnivore animal based mm -hmm. low carb world we we all kind of get there somewhat through desperation almost that Definitely. we have to face our own problems so I'd love to hear a little bit about that because you've both had some you know challenges with health and how have you come full circle on that and now you get to sit here and tell your stories what's going on there yeah I think we we both have an interesting dynamic where we've both had our own perspective to nutrition I would say that mine was probably a little bit more extreme and out of necessity mm. where I think your story Harry is probably much more relatable to the average person that's working in nine totally. to five um, but you know really how we met is we played college baseball together we went to a small cool. school in the northeast and you know for myself I kind of I just justified everything I was doing was you know I'm an athlete I'm burning yeah. a lot of calories it's yeah. calories in calories out what I'm actually eating doesn't really matter yeah. You know, you're going to the 5.30 a.m. morning lifts at practice. You're taking a pre-workout. Yeah. You're doing the protein shakes. And I think it was really my lifestyle that that led to me getting sick. And what I mean by that is I was ordering out my meals all the time, you know, getting, getting pizza late at night. I was drinking way too much alcohol. And then at that period of time, I was definitely chronically stressed out where mm. instead of focusing on the competition and of my love of baseball, I was putting so much pressure on myself to perform yeah like I remember like almost physically getting sick before I would play mm. um so as I as I look back hindsight being 2020 it was definitely all these factors that led to me getting sick and so uh June of 2016 I was working an internship in New York City at the time and I was in New Jersey I was commuting into New York and the commute was like two hours one way so it was four hours total so it was a little bit of a haul yeah um but I was excited it was like my first it was my first job in New York City and I started noticing that I started feeling more of an urgency to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And then I started noticing a little bit of blood in my stool mm. in June. And, you know, and I don't know if it was just stupidity or thinking I was invincible or embarrassment. It was probably a combination of those things. I just didn't tell anyone about it. I yeah. was like, oh, it'll just, you know, it'll work itself out naturally. Yeah. It's fine. And then as the summer went on, the urgency got more and more. There was more and more blood. And by the end of that summer in August, I was literally going to the bathroom over 20 plus times a day. Wow. I ended up losing almost 30 pounds. I ended up getting, my, I, I checked myself into the ER the last day of my internship. I had to leave early because I literally just, that two hour train ride that I referenced, it literally became unbearable. I was yeah. in the toilet the entire time. Um, so I got a colonoscopy, got diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, mm. which is an inflammatory bowel disease that affects your large intestine, mm -hmm. your colon. It's actually most most common. It's with men in their 20s. Mm. And I don't know, a lot of people don't know why that is, mm. but it's an autoimmune disease. So what they tell you is that there's there's no cure. The yeah. best that they can do is put it into remission. So they put me on these very expensive biologic drugs. The drug was called Remicade mm. and it cost, I would get an, a blood infusion every eight weeks and each infusion cost $50,000. Damn. So luckily, you know, had really good insurance, but you know, four, $400,000 per year. And they, you know, they tell you that you're going to be on these meds for the rest of your life yeah. because there's no cure. Um, so I end up going on these medications. I graduate from college. And then for me, everything changed when I was living on my own after I graduated, because I, I started cooking and starting to like mm. take control of the food that I was putting into my system, doing endurance races, marathons, triathlons, half Ironmans, things like that. 
kind of how we we converged is that Harry and I were supposed to do a half Ironman together, mm -hmm. but I wasn't being super intentional with the food that I was eating. Mm -hmm. And I actually had a flare up that was so bad I had to miss the race. Mm. So that for me was like, I can't continue living my life like this. This is not working. Yeah. Like when your life is revolved around having to go to the bathroom and go to the toilet, especially as a man in your twenties, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's not, a, it's not the way to go through life. Yeah. And then everything for me changed in 2019. And why I say that is I heard Sean Baker go on Rogan's podcast. Yeah, right. It was, it was in 2017, but I didn't find out about it until 2019. And he's talking about the carnivore diet. So, you know, all animal products, it's a removal diet. Everything we've been taught about meat is incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, it's some of the most nutrient dense foods you can put in your system. But the kicker for me was he started mentioning all these people that were healing autoimmune diseases yeah. through this diet. So from my perspective, I'm thinking, okay, if I can get off drugs that are 400K a year that aren't even fully working, like they got me out of my room, they got me um, out of that initial flare up, but right. I still was not great by any means. Yeah, yeah. Why would I not try that diet? Yes. So I have like such a vivid memory of going to Whole Foods, getting steak, chicken thighs, eggs, things like that. And just being like, you know what? I'm going to try this diet for one week. Yeah. I can do anything for a week. But what if this actually works? Like there was actually a belief in my mind that maybe this crazy diet mm -hmm. could actually mm -hmm. work. And literally within the first two weeks, it was like I, I went from going to the bathroom probably like five, six times a day down to like one to two. Mm. My skin got better. My energy got better. I was putting on more muscle at the gym. Any type of anxiety I had went away. Wow. And that for me was the ticket of like food truly is medicine. And now we're sitting here, you know, five, six years later and I'm off of all my medication, no inflammation, no microinflammation, and just living life on my terms. And if I, I, I truly feel like nutrition and the food that we put in our body was the gateway to yeah. me getting my health back. And yeah. that's been a huge base layer of our show. Um, and I know Harry has his own amazing perspective too, but we're just two guys that have like healed and learned through the power of anecdote and yes. story. And it's just, it's just amazing what you can do when you take control of the food you put in your system. Amen. I want to talk about that personal responsibility piece and really mm -hmm. taking agency back because um, it's really powerful. And mm -hmm. it's sad when you're on a journey like that because going through and seeing these specialists, I'm almost certain that nobody said, what are you eating? Let's mm -hmm. think about that for a second, mm -hmm. right? You had to unfortunately go and find that yourself. And I'm glad you did because mm -hmm. now it's become a part of your, you know, your story and it's really powerful. But it's uh, the system is somewhat failing people in that regard, right? And, and you're right, take your power back and food is medicine and if we treat it that way. So yes. appreciate you sharing that, man. It's really yeah. cool. Thank you. And Harry, what about you? What's your story? Yeah, so I'm, I think the short version of my story is, you know, was an athlete in college and then started working a corporate job and sort of lost my health. Mm. Um, and what I mean by that is like, just put on a little bit of weight, like wasn't really feeling like my old athletic self. And so I was the type of person prior to um, playing sports in college, like in high school, I was really, really dialed in on kind of the performance side of things. So I worked out at a gym where there was high level trainers who were teaching us all these different movement patterns, yeah. pretty advanced stuff. They were born out of the Eric Cressy School of Training, which is a huge name in the mm -hmm. world of baseball performance. Cool. And so I learned a ton about performance in the world of training, but wasn't fully dialed in on the nutrition front. Yeah. But I still was feeling great and by all means like putting on a ton of muscle training yeah. really hard and then i got to college and started tinkering with my diet and training as well so like i kind of like hit this peak where i was like really focused on diet was ex experimenting with paleo and also training really hard and then graduated and kind of just like threw all that away mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um stopped training as hard was really focused on my job started eating you know doritos and oreos every time mm -hmm. i walked past the kitchen in in my office and blink and four or five years later i'm like dude i, I don't look or feel great at mm -hmm. all i had put on 20 pounds and 20 30 pounds um and was not okay with it you know i started feeling um just like i needed to make some changes and this was yeah. kind of two three months before covid started i started tinkering again with diet and lifestyle so mm -hmm. I was starting to get really a, a bit more intentional about the food I was putting in my body. So experimenting with a keto diet and was having some success and then COVID hit and I went from commuting an hour each way to having that time back. Nice. I yeah. went to cooking all my, from cooking zero meals to mm. cooking all of my meals. Uh, I went from like feeling like I needed to be in the gym, but not doing the right things in the gym to just simplifying everything and walking 
as my form of exercise and just doing kind of like basic things. Yeah. So I was doing push ups, ring pull ups, bands. And in a matter of two months, I was in the best shape that I'd been in because I was just focusing on these basic fundamental aspects of health. So getting more sleep and the food yeah. and the exercise. So to me, I, I had just lost something that I knew was like a part of me. Um, like this whole health has, has been a, a part of who I was since high school. Yeah. But I, I started working that job and like forgot about it yeah. for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, it just didn't, it wasn't as important to me because I was trying to, you know, do the right things at work and, you know, mm -hmm. be there late. It was an intense job. So was there late often. Um, and then over time just realized like, Hey, I need to make some changes. So those changes happen. And that really put a lot of momentum behind me. I was like, I can never go back to living that way again. Yeah. So we signed up for that Ironman that Brett was talking about and we started training for it probably, I mean, it was like middle of COVID, you know, so we had about a year's worth of training under our belt before we did the race. And I think that was kind of our North star. Like, yeah, we're going to do this race. And originally it was in July and then it was got in canceled. Canada and got canceled. And we're like, what are we going to do? Like, we want to do this thing, right? We wanted to do this race together. Obviously, uh, there's a point where we were talking about doing it in two different, like doing two different just races after we had talked it. about training yeah. and they're like, let's just do Waco. We'll live together for a month leading up to it. Do like, do it right. Like this is going to be a memorable experience. Let's make it a memorable experience. And we kind of did exactly what we set out to do with that. Whereas we lived together, we had an amazing time in Austin. We had a Airbnb here in Austin, we ended up extending that for another two months. And I think that was just this like breeding ground for mm -hmm. both of us leaning into what we really wanted to do with our lives. Love that. And yeah. it was really all, like predicated on making these tweaks and changes. Brett obviously needed to make changes yeah. out of necessity. Mine was just, dude, you're you're not the athlete you once yeah. once used to be, and you got to get back to that. So yeah, hmm. yeah, I think that's that's kind of like the ground zero of the mafia. That's cool, man. What I'm hearing as well is like, there's this common thread with being accountable to some athletic pursuit. And I think like you said, when you entered into the workplace and all of a sudden your priority shifts and you're in a high pressure environment, it's like, all right, let's hustle and ascend the corporate ladder all of a sudden that performance aspect kind of gets deprioritized because yeah, I've got this other stuff going on. You hit on something that's really important. We talk about it a lot, like environmental design, like we, we, we absorb the values of our environment. And if our environment is filled with just this culture and also an abundant access to processed food and snacks, right? We can't usually outsmart our environments. You know, the easiest way mm -hmm. to not eat that stuff is to not be around it, you know, to like pantry purge and get it all out. But to, to, I'm curious about this accountability to the Ironman, accountability mm. to sports and how losing that kind of was the, the, the catalyst for you almost losing your health and then regaining it through that process. Because I think we, we, we use this term a lot, right? What's your why? And, and having something kind of accountable to on the calendar. Um, but it can sometimes be the thing that people need to anchor to in order to have a little bit more discipline, to have a little bit more of like, this is what I'm really working for. Because the truth is like, life is really stressful. I'm sure you've spoke to a lot of people where this just, just fades into obscurity in the mind and not thinking about the quality of the food. So how important is it for you guys? And I, I'm guessing the podcast is an extension of this, but Definitely. you know, going through different things in your life too have something to be accountable to, to give you that extra layer of um, accountability and discipline on your health journey. Yeah, I would say that everything with the nutrition, the podcast, everything we're doing now is just an extension of trying, like when we were done playing a sport or being part of a team, I think a lot of people struggle with this. There's there's such a purity to going after something with the, sh with the same common yes. mission as your whole team. And I think a lot of people try and get that same feeling in a corporate job. Yeah. And it's never going to give you that same feeling. You know, you're doing it from a financial perspective. There's yeah. not this, there's not this like greater shared vision. And I think we were both craving that. And I think a lot of people are missing that. So I think us going carnivore, taking control of our nutrition, even the podcast is our version of really trying to find that. And Love that's it. something that's been really big for us that anyone can do is finding, putting one big event on the calendar yes. year that, yeah. that scares you, that you can anchor it to as your focal point. Yeah. Whether that's a 10K, a half marathon, an Ironman, a Spartan race, it doesn't even need to be anything endurance related. A yeah. jiu-jitsu competition, just something that you can really anchor yourself to where you're like, I don't, I think I could be ready for this. I don't know how well I'm gonna do. And then you just, you, you force yourself to go right. do it and try and do it to the best of your ability. And for us, that Ironman was it for a number of different reasons because 
it got us out of the Northeast. We, mm-hmm. were, we were both, we both had that feeling of what you were talking about of, you know, the Northeast is great to build your career, but there's a lot of drinking. There's a lot of happy hours. It's not a super active lifestyle. Yeah. So it, it got us out of the Northeast. And then it also just gave us the confidence of putting this massive event on the calendar and then doing it and being like, wow, we actually can do anything that we set our minds to. Yeah. And that gave us the confidence to be like, well, why can't we write about nutrition? Why can't we put this stuff out on Twitter? Why can't we record a podcast and get on like the biggest guests that we've looked up to? Yeah. It's like, you need that proof of concept and that belief. And that's what that, I think doing that one big event a year really does is it instills that confidence in you. Love mm. that, man. Yeah. I would only add, I think raising the stakes is incredibly important. And this, the idea of kind of getting rid of option B, like when you're all in on, something or all in on like a podcast in our example like all we want to do is bring the best we have every Mm -hmm. single day to that podcast so that means eating right Mm -hmm. that means exercising and taking care of ourselves in a degree that we really couldn't we could get away with in the Mm -hmm. corporate environment the corporate environment insulates you to a degree that you start thinking growth is really linear and growth is absolutely not linear Mm. like our show grew because we went all in on something and it was pretty flat for a while but then all of a sudden like we started hitting like seeing patterns of like like uh like hyperbolic growth that happened almost in in a span of a few weeks yeah and that's what the real that's like what real growth feels like it happens it's a over a long period of time but it, it happens in an insane insanely quick uh, moment when you start to like realize the real gains of that. And yeah. I think there's a lot to that, that you miss when you're in that corporate environment, when you're insulated from kind of this, the, um, repercussions of not being able to bring your best every day, like you're yeah, going to get a definitely. paycheck. So the risk isn't really pushing you to bring everything you have every single day. And I think there's something to that because Mm -hmm. I know I'm motivated more than ever to be as healthy as I can be because I want to get the most out of our show. I want to get the most out of everything that we're doing uh, on the competitive front with the races that we're doing and and everything else. So um, I think just raising the stakes and trying to avoid this idea of there's an option B for me. Just go all in on something. All in. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I, I'm, I'm really curious about, because I, I fully agree with that. And I think that life rewards people that go all in. But I also think there is uh, a lot of resistance in mm-hmm. our minds when we're trying to go all in, because usually there's a safer option, right? It's And, and then there's this, there's this thing that's alive in us that we want to pursue. And the kind of closer we get to the edge of the proverbial diving board, if you will, that the louder the voice of resistance is, it tells you all the reasons why you shouldn't jump into that thing. You shouldn't pursue that thing. And that's part of why change is so difficult. So I'm curious from a, a mindset and habits perspective, how you guys have managed the resistance. I'm sure there's probably been some imposter syndrome along the way, like what is happening here and who are we? And, mm-hmm. and just putting yourselves out there. I mean, there's an extra layer of accountability in doing what you guys do because you're you're stating your opinions, you're putting yourself out there, you're leading forward. So how do you manage to stay grounded, you know, at the mm-hmm. level of the mind and, and move through that resistance and, you know, cultivate that discipline and just give yourself the permission to go all in and trust that that's the right thing for you? Mm-hmm. I, I think we were, we were talking about this in the car ride over. I think that having, like, I think that we both consider ourselves to be really fortunate that like we're best friends and we're also co-hosts Yeah, because you get that accountability of having at least one other person. Yeah, That's why I think like joining things like men's groups or accountability groups or having another person or like a close circle of friends that can be your advisors is so helpful. Yeah, And I know the feeling of when I, when I lived in New York and I was going carnivore, I knew that that was what I was really passionate about when I was seeing these changes and teaching my friends and coworkers how to eat the right way. And I, I tried to, I thought about writing a blog for my story and I, I wrote it like five different times and ended up scrapping it because I was afraid of the judgment mm-hmm. of like, what the hell do I actually know? Like, I'm not qualified to speak about nutrition. And I think now our, our North star is like, we focus more on what what would happen if we put this content out there and it actually helps someone get healthier yeah like instead of focusing on the judgment focus on if you actually put your heart and soul into this mission what if you can actually help other people get healthier and change their lives yeah. especially for us like everything we're doing is an extension of us being the ceo of our own health and taking our health and nutrition into our own hands it's fueled everything so imagine if we can get other people to eat the right foods and have amazing, amazing energy, and that helps them live a higher quality of life. It's like we're literally depriving these people of information. So I think that's a really helpful mental model, as a very much as opposed to focusing on, oh, what do I actually know? Focus on focusing on, no, you know more than you think you know, and you're literally depriving society of your gifts by not yes. putting that out there to the world. Love that yeah. reframe. And you don't need to have the perfect 
perspective or all the data to support certain things. Definitely. It, it can just be your unique perspective and your unique voice that lands on a certain set of ears. And it's like, wow, I really like the way that that person said that. Yes. That moved me. It made, it inspired me. That's what people are ultimately looking for. I think yes. in the health space is to be inspired by someone, someone's story, a journey, and then they can latch onto it, relate to it yes. and start making changes for themselves. So I think in a lot of ways, it's less about teaching people what they need to be doing. It's more like, how do you need to be doing it? Like mm -hmm. how to approach your day and really make it fun. I think we've talked about that from mm -hmm. the beginning, like enjoy the process of getting healthier and like you can get a lot of people excited about getting healthier along the way. So yeah. like we've leaned into that a lot. It's like, don't let perfection stop us from doing something and make it fun. That's kind of been like our framework. Mm -hmm. I love that thread. I want to pursue that a little bit because in the health space, we can like, like we, like we talked about with our journeys and we all have our own reasons for kind of, you know, now health being one of our primary values and drivers in life. And it can get a little serious sometimes, right? Cause mm -hmm. you start looking at all of the toxic foods and the big food industry, and then you start to go on environmental toxins and all of a sudden you can really start to be like, wow, everything's kind of out to get us. And you know, it becomes uh, pretty strict and we can bounce back into orthorexia, you know, this mm -hmm. unhealthy obsession with health. So how do you keep health fun? Now, obviously, you know, you've, you've got your stories around how you build a diet. It's very much aligned with an animal-based, carnivore-based pyramid. But how do you not get so sucked into, you know, sucking the fun out of that? Because health should be fun, right? It should be playful. It should be expansive. And I feel like sometimes we can take it a little bit extreme and it gets constrictive. So what are some tangible ways that you guys make your health journey fun? How do you keep it, you know, playful and, and, and keep growing through that? Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of the answer to your question kind of lies in that experience that we had had training for the Ironman when we were living at an Airbnb together in Austin. And what we were doing is like we were prioritizing really good quality animal protein. We were cooking our meals. We were getting outside every day. We were getting into the sauna. We were lifting heavy weights. And we just were like latching on to like each other and just trying to push each other to become better. And I think that's the beautiful thing about like an animal based diet or a carnivore diet or a keto diet or whatever, that, whatever it is, is it doesn't feel like you're white knuckling. You're not mm -hmm. restricting on calories. You're eating these incredible nutrient dense mm -hmm. meals that are so satiating. They're bursting with flavor. And it's like these simple meals taste so good. Mm -hmm. It's actually fun. And we were doing things like, hey, why don't we let's learn one new recipe a week, just trying to like ah, just spice that. it up and keep yeah. it interesting. But I, I think a lot of what it's come down to for us is like taking these very simple principles of, of cooking your meals, lifting heavy weights, prioritizing animal protein, and just doing it day in and day out. Yeah. But the big thing is not guilting yourself if you screw up or, you know, last week we, we got a pizza. Harry's little brother was, was leaving. He's, he had been staying with us for the last month. So we're like, let's celebrate and get yeah. some really good pizza. We enjoyed the hell out of the pizza. Mm -hmm. And I, I still felt fine the rest, the mm -hmm. next day because our body is resilient. The Bingo. body is meant to be resilient. If I eat some seed oils, yeah, I'm not trying to eat seed oils, but if I have some seed oils, it's not going to kill you. Yes. So that's something we've been spending a lot of time thinking about is resilience. All right, yeah. I'm, I'm going to brand this. We've got the three C's of making, of making your health journey fun. Cooking. Yeah. Community. Love carnivory. It. Yeah, I love yeah, that. I love that. That's Did awesome. Did you just come up with that on the spot? Right. On the spot. On the nice. spot. Good Look show. at that. It's like an that. exclusive. I love, that. <laughs> yeah. love that. Yeah. No, that's really cool. And I think I think you're dead right. I think the goal of getting healthy as well is creating this resiliency that if life, you know, puts you in a position where the God forbid there's a couple of slices of pizza that you are so in control and you value health so much that it doesn't turn into this epic binge because you're not so guilt trippy, you're not so restrictive. And that if those foods do come in, then you rebound and you're resilient because you are healthy. Your gut is working well and you probably understand mm -hmm. that challenge more than anything else. And one of the things that we we focus on a lot, especially with our seven step framework is the elimination of processed foods because what I'm hearing in your journeys is not necessarily always what you add in that mm -hmm. creates the healthiest diet. It's what you move out. It's the Cheetos every day. It's the gluten containing Definitely. grains. Like where do you guys currently fall in the eating habits, this relationship to processed food, how it's so invasive, how it's everywhere and how do you just empower people to become more aware of that and, and help educate them a little bit on the importance of, hey, maybe the these easy, quick choices of food are not serving you in the long run. Mm. I, think, I think maybe hitting on the last point there, the elimination diet teaches you a lot about how food uh, interacts with your body. And yeah. I think everyone should go through a period of 30 days of just eliminating processed foods. I agree. 
and seeing how you feel, but then reintroducing other foods because you kind of, you figure out your baseline at that point and then you can reintroduce other foods and see how they interact with your body, see how they affect your energy, your sleep, your workouts, your focus when you're working. It affects basically your entire life, right? This is a food, food and fuel you're putting in your body. So an elimination diet, I think, is great for just building those data points for a person to be like, okay, I can actually take control of this health journey because I understand how this food is affecting me. Mm. Um, and I, I think that's a really important step for everyone to take. And then from there, it's like, I mean, for us, you know, we eat an animal-based diet, mm -hmm. we preach the animal-based diet, um, but we also think it's, it's really a lifestyle, not a diet. You're Bang trying up. to just mm -hmm. make it something that is seamless. Like it shouldn't be something that you're just always thinking about. It's like, this is just what I do yeah. and it's a part of my life and I don't think about it all the time. I'm just kind of like, love that. you know, on the highway driving 60 miles an hour, yeah. like cruise control. Yeah, love it, cool. Yeah, I would say that it, the other thing too is it's going to take a little bit of a little bit more energy and intentionality to eat this particular way and like getting out of the mindset of always optimizing for taste or convenience like you know getting DoorDash or Uber Eats delivered to your front door is like the antithesis of everything that we're talking about. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, for for us for for myself like I didn't know how to cook at all. Like I remember freaking burning the shit out of a steak or not really knowing <laughs> how to cook ground beef, but yeah. like that was my baseline and that was my starting point. And I think just teaching people, if you can just take control of the food you put into your body, and even if your starting point is just, you're gonna commit to like cooking all of your meals for a week straight and just see how you feel, that's that's an amazing starting yes. point too. But yeah. it's that it's a it's like we're so wired as a society to think like, oh, everything needs to be optimized for, you know, saving energy and convenience. And it's like, no, it's the it's the energy and the intentionality of what you invest in your decisions. That's where all the gold is. Yeah. And then you look back in a year and you're like, oh, my gosh, I lost 20 pounds. My skin is great. I healed these stomach issues all because I was so conscious of taking control of the food that I put into my system. It's amazing what that one decision can do for your life. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And I, I say it like if you make easy choices consistently, life gets mm -hmm. hard. Definitely. If you make hard choices consistently, life gets easier. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what you're describing, so right? It's like this just hedonic treadmill at the edge of our fingertips for door dash and other things that we rely on so much for these quick hits of dopamine. And it requires a little bit of awareness at first, a little bit of discipline, discipline to delay that gratification, to not hit DoorDash and to mm -hmm. learn how to cook a steak and to watch the YouTube videos, to figure out how to master the grill. But if you do the harder thing now, you're going to have an easier life because you're, you're going to find health. I mean, we know health is, health is the best thing, Definitely. but you said something, Harry, that's super important that we, we, it's, it's not just all about the food either. It becomes a lifestyle mm -hmm. like this animal based isn't just about how you feed yourself it's, it's about how you live and something we focus on here a lot is is habits um and and how we intentionally design our design our life so i'm curious what have become some of the cornerstone habits for you guys that you feel are really supportive of health that might not necessarily have to do with the diet but might be more to do with i don't know sunlight or how you walk or how you stimulate play or you know connections relationships mm -hmm. what are some of the things that really stand out for you in the habit realm mm. walking is one for me that stands out for sure i think if you can get a morning walk in 30 minutes, yeah. it, it, I'm just speaking from, from my own experience, that sets the tone for the rest of my day. I find it to be this incredibly therapeutic 30 minutes where you're getting sunlight, you're getting mm. a little bit of exercise, you're getting outside, and you, by the end of it, you come back and you have basically cleaned the slate. So anything that, any lingering thoughts or things that you've been maybe like brought into the night and like just slept on and did, didn't really like get over any lingering thoughts you've kind of erased by the time you get back home. And for me, I think that that foundational habit is something that leads to a lot of other positive yeah. changes that can happen. So, you know, a 30 minute walk in the morning can lead to you then maybe consistently going to the gym a little bit more yeah. or being a little bit more focused on what you want to prioritize in your day. Cause you spent 30 minutes on a walk thinking about what meals you're going to have that day Boom. and really anchoring your thinking mm -hmm. and like, okay, this is what I'm going to eat. This is uh, what I'm going to do for exercise today. And then, you know, you do it. And so I think that walk for me has always just been mm. a, a cornerstone habit. Definitely. Sounds like you're generating a lot of momentum, right? There's yeah. a cheesy line I always throw out, like if you win the morning, you win the day. Totally. And if life is just a series of days, you can look at it like from an, uh, you know, an, a sporting analogy that like we're, we're playing this uh, season, but it's over hopefully, you know, 80 years. And it's not about winning and crushing every single day, but it's about winning more days than you lose. And that becomes then about focusing on what we're in charge of now, generating momentum and the best place to do that. And I agree with you fully is in the morning, because mm -hmm. even if the rest of the day derails, at least you can look back to the morning and be like, all right, 
right, I got my sunlight, I did my walk, I did that thing, but you're much more likely to win the rest of the day when you're bringing that momentum into the, into the, you know, the, the remainder. And yeah. uh, what about you, brother? I, I think it's so, I, I think it's very similar and to add on to what you're saying. I think there's now a lot of criticism around morning exercise. Of mm. Like there's a lot of research of, oh, the body is better primed to <laughs> exercise midday or in the afternoon. And it's like, I get that, but we're not just doing it from a physical perspective. Mm -hmm. Like you've mentioned the, the person that I'm, that I am when I get a light run in the morning or a, a training session or a sauna session in the morning, it's literally two different people. Yeah. I'm happier. I'm more motivated. I'm better on our show. I'm more engaged. It's like, it, it's genuinely two different people. It's almost like a priceless investment. So that, that consistent morning exercise is huge, but something that we've really enjoyed is really being intentional about sourcing our food from from local farms and ranches and kind of scheduling two big meals a day around those ranches yeah um and those meals so for us right now we just moved to a new place that's right across from local pastures cool which is a local farm store in austin there they source that it's basically looks like a food truck but it's really like a little grocery store and they source their stuff from a few different local farms so we you know we go there once a week we load up on our our steak our meat for the week bone broth cheese all that good stuff yeah and we have it scheduled out like just even like getting the metrics of hey i know that if i'm eating two meals a day that's probably about two pounds of meat i have it all budgeted out and i throw in some ground beef i throw in some steak i throw in some chicken and i just bake my whole eating schedule around this this one awesome trip so yeah. not necessarily a uh, a daily thing but it's like the ritual of going there every single week being intentional about how we're sourcing our food and that leads to the preparation to set yourself up for a great week mm -hmm. i find that i think we get ourselves into trouble when we don't have the fridge stocked and we're like oh we'll just yeah. go out and eat or like when everything is ready to go in the fridge, it just, it, it primes you to really take control of that food and those meals that you have. Yeah, I love that. And, and you've been able to kind of make that more uh, holistic expression of this entire movement, this lifestyle mm -hmm. again, by putting, like voting with your dollar and putting that back Definitely. into the hands of our local farmers and our ranchers. And something we were talking about before we went live on the show, we're kind of, I don't want to sound dramatic, but we're kind of at war with this big food system, right? Mm -hmm. You know, this, this just, this monster of, you know, the push towards maybe more of a plant-based agenda, the, the, the shelves in the supermarket just filled with ultra processed food because it's cheap and it's profitable, but the cost is our health. And the way in which we're gonna change that, of course, it's it's a grassroots movement. I don't think it's gonna come from any top-down system or the mm -hmm. government coming in and saying like, oh right, yeah, we're gonna, we, we, we messed up, sorry, but we got really rich. It's like a, a citizen scientist movement. It's you guys living, it's it's me living, and it's, it's telling our stories again. And I think that's what it's all about. So. We're gonna get into some callers here uh, mm. in a minute and do some live callers on the show, which is really fun. But I just wanna open the floor for any kind of just closing statements from you gents before we get into the Q and A's. Is there anything you'd love to impart on the listener about anything we've spoke about today? Any words of wisdom, anything that you wish maybe you'd have heard on your journey 10 years ago mm. that you're like, yeah, that, that was really transformational for me. Mm. Open floor if there's anything there and then we'll take some callers. Mm. Yeah, something that always sticks with me is just starting small. So mm. I, tr I Personally, I just like simplifying things. I do think health is complicated, but it's also very easy. So if you can just start small, implement one thing a week for a month. And so you'll have four new habits by the end of the month and you'll have done them all for a long period of time and gotten consistent with them. That will generate a force of momentum that mm. will positively impact your life, potentially like in infinity going forward, yeah. right? Until the day you die, because you've you've taught yourself and you've built trust with yourself that you can incorporate a habit so i think it's really all about starting small and just doing a little thing it could be a cold shower mm, a 10 minute yeah. walk um cooking one one new recipe a week just a little thing that you can hold yourself accountable to and build trust with yourself and that momentum will carry you forward through your health journey and really help you build that intuition and start to make it fun. Cause at, at the beginning it's, it might not be fun, right? but yeah. that's why starting small is important. You can make it easier, lower the stakes and eventually you'll be like, okay, I'm a completely different person because I've built a number of different habits around my health. Yeah. Little by little, a little yeah. becomes a lot. Lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would say to, to kind of build off that something really important for me and for Harry as well, which I touched on earlier was like actually assuming the role of being the CEO of your own health. Mm. And so what I mean by that is not just blanket taking everything your doctor is telling you and listening to it to a T. Yeah. So if they're telling you to get on different types of antibiotics and different medication, like actually being willing to do, to do your research and figure out, you know, could there be a way for diet and lifestyle to mm -hmm. have its role? So for, for myself, I was fortunate that 
my GI that I was seeing for my colitis, I would bring him different uh, pieces of research or different things that I was doing with the carnivore diet. And even though he didn't have a ton of knowledge and a ton of insight, he at least understood what I was doing. And we awesome. would kind of talk through that stuff together. So like finding yourself a, a doctor that's really open and responsive to, to trying to make some of these changes, I think is massive. Yes. Um, there, there's a website called the Society for Metabolic Health Practitioners that will literally show you a full list of doctors by region that will actually talk to you and, and treat you from a, a holistic lens and talk to you about diet and lifestyle. Um, so I, th I think that's massive because if I just blanket listen to my doctors, I would still be on medication that was costing $400,000 a year, just kind of on the, the, the medical merry-go-round of the Western medicine. So I think that's just so important. Yeah, I agree. It's happening, boys. We're turning the tide slowly but surely. Definitely. And I, I feel like I can, I can smell mm. a beefy waking up. Uh, oh, people yeah. are taking the power back. And um, yeah. that, 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 that was really exciting to hear about mm. those more. There's more options now as well in these mm -hmm. holistic practitioners. I think that's going to tie in really cool to this first question we've got here. So we're going to move into some live callers. The mm. first caller we've got today is Sherry. He's calling from New York, your old stomping grounds. Love it. <laughs> uh, Sherry's got a question about getting slapped on the wrist by a doctor because of a high cholesterol number. So Sherry, if you're on the line with us, please tell us a little more of the story and then let's see what we've got for you. Hey, how are you doing? Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for joining us. So first and foremost, you know, Steve, thank you for doing these podcasts. I mean, you're just like helping this, this tribe that we're trying to create and just giving us support and community and yay, yay. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Appreciate it. Um, so my, my question is about cholesterol. And uh, so I've been doing the carnivore diet um, pretty strictly, just doing beef and butter and no salads, no seed oil, um, some eggs, um, probably on my sixth week now. And I'm feeling amazing. I've lost weight, which I needed to do. My resting uh, fasting insulin um, that I test in the morning, that was around 104 to 119, has gone down to like 79. So I'm thrilled. Amazing. But I, uh, I had blood work up done um, about four months ago, and of course, my and this was prior to the carnivore diet, and my uh, levels were high, um, according to the doctor, and it, they've run high throughout my life, and they're always trying to stick me on a statin, and I just kind of mm. just, you know, say, okay, and never take the prescription, and never go on it, and I won't. But I'm concerned because, um, you know, it's hovering around, 200 now the total cholesterol is like 267 and i listen to paul saladino and i listen to dr ken bird uh, barry and sean baker and i know that the ldls are not necessarily those numbers are, are indicative of heart disease and it's the bus that transports all the lipid proteins to for, for cholesterol but i guess my question without going off on a tangent here is how does one actually go to a doctor and, and get a test without getting, you know, the riot act from a doctor who mm -hmm. most of them don't have a carnivore diet. They're not open to hearing about it. And, um, and, and how do I navigate like what my numbers are and, and are they okay or not okay? I've had a stress test. Everything came back great. Um, I had echocardiogram. Everything came back great. But my levels and my ratios don't really speak to that. Yeah, cool. Well, Sherry, congrats for standing up for yourself and, and turning down the statin. I think, you know, we, we would all agree that that should be a very last ditch effort and that the diet and lifestyle could address a lot of this, what you're talking about. So firstly, of course, it sounds like you're in all the right places and listening to all the right resources in terms of, you know, vetting those opinions and things are moving in the right direction. You know, at the same time, five months on this way of eating is really good, but we'd like to turn that into five years and 10 years and see those changes over time. But you're pretty much spot on, and, and I'm sure the guys have something to add here. When we see those cholesterol numbers go up, as they will commonly do on a carnivore slash animal-based diet, and there's this maybe myopic focus in medicine that all, all LDL is bad, um, but how much mm -hmm. of that LDL is oxidized, for example, a high number over 200 is high, but there's some counter research to that that shows actually healthy ranges are more in 225 to 250, and it sounds like you're right about those ranges. And of course, we're not doctors, but what we can do is advise you to kind of become, again, that citizen scientist, go to places like Merrick Health, where you can get your blood work done and, and you know, basically then vet the numbers against the amazing resources from people like Dr. Paul or these other carnivore doctors and 
Dave Feldman and people like that who understand the cholesterol kind of um, process a lot more. I'm sure you guys have come across this in this space. Like cholesterol is something that our culture is obsessed with. And in the carnivore space, we're usually going to see that creep up. What experts have you had on or how have you kind of reframed the thinking around cholesterol on your own journeys? We had a number of experts on. We had Dave Feldman on. Uh, and I think his research is is unique. I think he's kind of shifting the paradigm around mm -hmm. cholesterol and making us think a little bit more critically about it. I, I think we'd openly admit that we're not the experts in, in this topic, yeah. but what I would say is there are a lot more doctors out there who are open to having this mm -hmm. conversation and they're all starting telemedicine practices. So awesome. we had uh, Brian Lenskis on the podcast, Dr. Brian Lenskis, um, Dr. Tro on the podcast. Both of these are guys who are low carb guys and they understand the paradigm shift that's happening around cholesterol. And they're at least going to be open to the idea of prescribing diet and lifestyle. And, and in fact, they will prescribe diet and lifestyle changes before they tell you any any sort of uh, medical prescription uh, or suggest getting on a statin because both of those guys changed their lives completely, their health yep. completely because they lost a bunch of weight and did it through a low carb diet, which was a primarily then if it's a low carb diet, it's a high fat yep. diet. So they embraced the eating more dietary cholesterol and it had amazing benefits for them. So, you know, I, th I think for us, it's like not like you want to look into the details, you want to get the blood work, but you also need to look at the other metrics. Like yeah, you're losing yeah. weight, um, you're getting better sleep, you're feeling way better. Like those are equally as important as looking yeah. at a number at a screen. That's yeah. huge. It's it's so well said. Another great resource would be uh, Doctor Phil mm -hmm. I don't know if you if you know who he is, but he's actually a, he's a heart surgeon based out of Florida, and he wrote a book called Stay Off My Operating Table. He's performed thousands of heart surgeries. Yeah. Was following a standard American diet and was like over three hundred pounds ended up going low carb and then carnivore and lost hundreds of pounds mm -hmm. and now preaches to the the different metrics of metabolic health and yeah. basically says there's far more to the equation than just singularly focus on on your LDL cholesterol. Yeah. I think number one, which I think Sherry's already familiar with, is your your HDL to triglyceride ratio mm -hmm. is far more indicative of a, of healthy fats than as opposed to the LDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are way more metrics. But I think a lot of it goes back to what Harry was saying is that you're probably gonna have to find a doctor through some of these decentralized medicine yeah. sources. They're probably not gonna be covered by insurance, but you're gonna get really good quality of care and actually find a doctor that's willing to work with you to talk to, to, talk to you about this stuff. Yeah. Otherwise, you're probably just at the will of someone that's gonna pre prescribe you a statin or a drug or something like that. That's yeah. just been our experience. I love that, that's so good. So hopefully there's some good resources in there for you, Sherry. And, and yeah, I think Harry kind of hit the nail on the head there as well. Don't get so myopically focused on what numbers are saying. If you feel great and you're looking better and everything's moving in the right direction, that's, that's you becoming your own doctor in a sense, right? The root of the word is teacher mm -hmm. and you're learning through experience. So check out those resources though excellent stuff guys next up is ashley from virginia so she's got a question about swollen fingers ashley what's mm -hmm. going on with your swollen fingers hey good morning guys good morning thanks good morning. for taking my call i i also need to testify while i'm on here so i don't know if you want to talk about my question first or want me to brag but um, brag let's hit, hit us with the brag <laughs> testify okay Okay, I'll do that. So I am a mom of five boys. Um, my second oldest boy was also, um, he's 24, but he was diagnosed with colitis in the seventh mm. grade, and it's been a battle for our whole family for a long time, and he's actually the one that turned us on to the supplements and to the carnivore diet, and we're all doing it cool. along the way. You know, we're making baby steps. Nutrition and natural health has been a big deal to me for a long time. And for a long time, my kids thought I was crazy and now they're on board, which is exciting. But, you know, I don't buy cereal. I don't, you know, there's just a lot of stuff that we have eliminated and then adding in the, the beef and going more with that. We don't eat a lot of bread. Um, I try to bake bread, sourdough mm -hmm. and some stuff like that, but we're excited. You know, if we get a sore throat, it's where's the colloidal silver. It's not, you know, run to the doctor. Mm. We use essential oils. We use a lot of natural products but um my son with the colitis is really getting better you know he's working on it and he is taking supplements the heart and soil supplements and doing the carnivore so we're we're on the right path awesome. and i'm excited um my 18 year old son is an athlete at the beginning of football season he was diagnosed with a torn meniscus and told he would have to have surgery and his season was over and maybe his baseball season. Mm. We immediately came home and started him on the bone matrix and also found 
an alternative exercise. Um, he was off of it for two weeks, and then after the inflammation went down, we found this guy in California, this um, chiropractor that does videos on YouTube and whatever. And he did, we were doing these exercises, and he just finished a great season, football season. He's getting ready to play baseball. He was two weeks out, three weeks out That's awesome. um, of football. And his knee immediately like got better. His scans were all clear. It was just really a miracle. So the bone matrix was a lifesaver for him. So and cool. we are really thankful and excited. So we're we're on board for sure. Yeah. Um and we we share it with all of his buddies who get hurt and have injuries and you know, I'm constantly sharing with everybody because it's it's exciting to know that, you know, we don't have to go mainstream mm-hmm. medical to have surgery and have all these things done to our bodies if mm-hmm. we can try, you know, the way God intended for us to heal our bodies naturally. Mm. So thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Um, but all that being said, a lot of mornings I wake up with really swollen, puffy fingers. And it's just the weirdest thing. I do. I think it's a circulation thing. My mm. feet are always cold. My hands are always cold. Um, so I'm on bone matrix for joint stuff. And then I do the skin hair and nail, Mm -hmm. but I just am wondering if y'all have any thoughts or ideas or suggestions on the the edema that I deal with. Cool. Well, firstly, good job, mama. Uh, A mom of five boys. I know you're very busy and it sounds like you're leading them beautifully. So good job. And on the, on the swelling, yeah, we'll kind of riff on that and see, we'll see, see if anything kind of resonates with you. It's interesting, you know, the, the, the cold hands and feet a lot can sometimes be a sign of a slowing metabolism maybe the thyroid is getting a little bit sluggish and that could be so many things it could be that you're not eating uh total enough food like pure calories maybe you need a little bit more i'd be curious to hear about you know are you fasting a lot and 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 sometimes you know fasting is an incredible tool but at times it can also be stressful and and i'm guessing you know just managing five boys and you know being a mm-hmm. modern human that there can be a lot of stress in life uh, i'm also curious about potential electrolyte issues here like sodium balance and mm-hmm. You supplement in with electrolytes. Um, so I'm gonna let the other guys have a pop and throw some things at you, and then we'll invite you back on and see if any of that's resonating. Have you guys got anything to add there that you potentially think about? I was only gonna just add on the electrolyte point because yeah. the only time I've ever run into swollen fingers was uh, deep in the woods at our 100k race, and yeah. I was running into a, an electrolyte issue, and my fingers got really fat. Um, and so I think I was I, I had too much sodium, mm. um, so that was causing it. Mm-hmm. But I think it can go either way. Yeah. Um, I was also running a race, so it's right. entirely different. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I don't. I don't have much to add on that topic. Yeah. Like, to be honest with you, I mean, we we obviously have a ton of sodium, and that's been super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. But um, one of the things that I was gonna say with Ashley's older boy that has colitis. Yeah. A, a book that was super impactful to me was a book called The Maker's Diet by yeah. Jordan Rubin. He's he founded Garden of Life Nutrition. He had debilitating Crohn's for years. Mm-hmm. And basically like took a bunch of the principles of the Bible and eating Mm -hmm. real foods and making his own bone broth and things like that and holistically healed himself of like debilitating Crohn's and he was basically going to die. It's called the maker's diet. It's an incredible book. Very cool. Very cool. So Ashley, let's, let's, let's discuss on that a little bit. Um, stress levels, electrolytes, are you fasting a lot? Do you think if you're, you know, taking a critical assessment of your food intake that there's just enough nutrition in there, you know, you're obviously doing the animal based. One thing I want to touch on is you did say we're doing a little bit of bread. You didn't say we're doing no bread. And sometimes if you're very Mm. gluten sensitive, there can be an inflammatory response there. So I'm just going to kind of ping pong it back over to you now after some of those points to see how you feel about any of that. Okay. Um, So if I do fast, it's not necessarily intentional. It's just maybe being busy and, you know, not eating until later in the day just because my day's gotten away from me. Um, I do find that I have gotten more hungry in the morning. So I try to eat some eggs or maybe a, you know, some berries and a, a protein shake, something like that. Um, I also do like, especially if the weather's hot towards the end of the day, my feet and ankles will also swell. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have often thought that maybe I get too much sodium, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe it is an electrolyte thing where I eat just too much salt and Mm -hmm. I haven't really worked with trying to reduce or eliminate that yet, but that might be something I can work on, you know, just kind of play with. Yeah. Cause I like a salty you know how, you know, you like to put a lot of salt on your steak or oh, whatever, yeah. but that, that could, that could be a part of it. I, it could be, I drink tons of water though. Yeah. Pretty much only water. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So I try to balance it out. I do eat considerable amount of fruit. Yeah. So what I'd say, Ashley, is 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 potentially you don't want to go no sodium. That's for sure. We know it's a very important electrolyte and it helps balance the other electrolytes. It, it, it could even feel like you're eating a lot of salt. You'd be surprised sometimes how you can get low salt. You just said you're drinking a ton of water. So if you're peeing a lot, you're urinating a lot, you're losing a lot of electrolytes in that process as well. Um, with the swollen ankles and stuff, too, I'm always curious about just lymph flow and drainage and I don't know how much you're exercising or moving, but the invitation here would be to try to get more of a, you know, a consistent daily walk in the mix, for example, mm. like to Harry's point, you know, throw in that 20 minute morning walk if it's, if it's available in your schedule and, and maybe sandwich the day and put in one at the end or, you know, break it up after meals or whatever. Just take a walk to see if it can help with the flow. That's one of the things that's really good about activating that parasympathetic nervous system when we walk is that we just increase blood flow. And it sounds like maybe it's just pooling in the fingers and the feet because because maybe we're sedentary outside of our exercise practice or whatever. Again, cautious on going no salt, but certainly put yourself in a position where you say, okay, for this week, let me lower it a little bit and see how I feel. If the swelling doesn't go away, it's not necessarily a salt issue, right? If it does, then there's something going on there. But I would just check in with other lifestyle factors, obviously keeping stress in check, moving more. I think this is a tricky one because it's hard to sometimes say what's causing it. But I think with a few of those tips, you're probably gonna be able to move in the right direction. And in terms of what you add, it sounds like you've, you know, you've got all of the good stuff going on. You've got the heart and soil supplements in there, you're an animal-based diet. So yeah, I think the a little bit elimination of less salt, elimination of gluten for a period of time to just see if that's got anything going on and then the addition of keeping that movement mm. in check a little bit more thanks for calling and ashley i hope there's something good and juicy for you there <laughs> and uh, last but not least is jake jake's calling from utah he's been on this journey for uh, a couple of months now and he's making liver jerky he's got some mm. questions about that so what, what, what's going on jake what tell us about this liver jerky it sounds delicious <laughs> Hey, yeah, it's, uh, it was a good way for me to, to get it in. Thanks for uh, uh, for hopefully answering some questions. So I, I just have two general questions about liver. And, yeah, first off, I um, decided I was trying to, to get liver, um, and I get queasy pretty easy, just heck even looking at it or smelling it or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But uh, first off, I was like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call my butcher. Let's see if uh, if they can grind some, some liver for me. Mm. Well, they, they did. I got about four pounds ground liver, um, mixed that with about four pounds of, of just ground beef, went 50, 50 on it. Um, yeah, threw some salt in there and, uh, and dehydrated it. Um, and I was actually really impressed with how it turned out. It nice. snacked on that quite a bit. Um, and then next I just went to, you know, thinly sliced liver, dehydrating it, um, and, and salting it. Um, I guess my question is, uh, as far as the liver goes and the dehydrating process, like, am I still getting a bulk of those nutrients? Is that, is that a process I should avoid, not avoid? Like, just wondering if I'm losing a lot of that liver benefit by dehydrating it. Yeah, cool. Good question, Jake. I think this is a perfect example of not letting perfect be the enemy of good, right? Mm-hmm. There's like, I think we'd all agree that fresh is best, you know, and if you can do fresh, love those suggestions, like getting the 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 butcher to grind some into your ground beef and, and maybe having those like cooked. I think 50-50 is probably a bit aggressive because you definitely mm-hmm. taste the liver. So if definitely. you've got an aversion, maybe something like a 90-10 and then in the burgers with some salt and some good cheese in it, you're probably not going to taste it. But back to your your, your main question here. Fresh is best. Dehydration is the the act of going low and slow and sucking the water out of things to dry it. So you're going to preserve the vast majority of the nutrition in liver by dehydrating. The only potential issues you run into is the water soluble vitamins. So you're going to have like vitamin C, your B vitamins, and maybe some of the vitamin A lost a little bit, not completely though, uh, because you can't ever eliminate it completely. So again, Look, this is way better than not doing any liver whatsoever. Mm. Fresh is best. Desiccated supplements are really good, like Heart and Soil and other companies do those. And if you can source this liver on your own and make jerky, I think you're doing great, man. I think that's great. I think, yeah, if you wanted to split hers, maybe you're losing a little bit of nutrition. But honestly, it's great that you're just eating it and you're finding a way to make it work. And the only thing I would say about dehydration and its effects on micronutrients is low and slow. So Mm. I know some dehydrators go a little hotter and faster and that seems to be convenient but the the lower temp you can do it over the longer period of time the better it preserves more of that nutrition 
you guys, do you do, like, how do you get liver in? You do desiccated organs. Do you ever do the fresh stuff? How do you like to get creative with getting organs in the diet? Yeah, so when I first went carnivore in 2019, I was taking the the gut the the gut supplement. Yeah. I mean, it was it wasn't liver, but I was also taking a general organ supplement as well. But I found that in the beginning, I was definitely more squeamish to the taste. Yeah. So I would just go to my local farmers market. I we, I knew this regenerative farm when I was living in San Diego. I would uh, freeze freeze the liver and then chop it up into little yeah. capsules and yeah, basically cool. take it like a desiccated supplement. That was really helpful. And then what I what I actually found my favorite way to eat it is raw. And I'll literally just splash on some olive oil, some balsamic vinegar, and smoked sea salt, Ooh, and it actually tastes fancy. delicious. Yeah, and yeah. Um, that's kind of been my my preferred way. But I wouldn't say I get it in every day, but probably yeah. you know probably eat it two to three times a week, and it. it seems to work really well. Definitely notice some benefits from it. Cool, um, Harry. What's yeah. your relationship with liver? So similar to Brett, uh, I think those ancestral caveman blends too. Yeah, like definitely. Pack it into ground beef and just cook it. You can't really taste it no. there. So I think that's a great way to do it. That's where I've ultimately evolved to getting it from. Like yeah. I used to chop up liver and freeze it like pretty frequently. Yeah. And like I would get a bunch of liver from a butcher yeah. and a lot of it would end up going to waste because yeah. after like a few days, um, you know, the liver's not as fresh yeah. um, or like, you know, for whatever reason, forgot about it. Um, so I just think like, you know, a pound of liver is a lot. Like it there's is. so much nutrients in there. So if you can freeze dry it or, you know, desiccate it yourself, like that's like a great way to get it, but also just pack that into some ground beef. Yeah, I agree. Go. I think those burgers are the move. If you can do that, it sounds like you're getting it anyway. Um, So, you know, just take a little bit and, and like to your point, you don't need huge amounts of this every no. single day. We even say like as little as half an ounce a day. Um, yeah. it, so you're kind of microdosing it almost because it is so nutrient dense and not forgetting the organs are not just liver. I know liver is the one that we're like, oh, yeah. yeah, but like there's heart, you know, there's these other things that you can try too. Heart's delicious. I don't know whether you guys have heart tried grilling up some hearts like, like steak. steak. Yeah. yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. I genuinely enjoy eating it. And I think you touched on a good point too about not being, um, not letting perfect get in the, get in the way of being good enough yeah. where it's like a lot of people hate the taste of raw organs so much. They try to get themselves to eat it yeah. and they can't do it where it's like if you're taking a capsule or you're freezing it or you're dehydrating it. Yeah, maybe the nutrient profile isn't quite as good as the raw, yeah. but it's still that's your bridge to be able to get those organs in. That's right. Which is an unbelievable starting point, and it's way better than having no organs at all. Cool, cool. Yeah. Well, that's it for callers, guys, and that's kind of it for wrapping up the podcast. It's been a pleasure to chat with you. I love everything that you're doing, everything that you're sharing. Please tell the listeners where they can go and find you guys, what you're up to, any exciting stuff that's in the works, what's going on. Yeah, so you can find us on uh, Apple or Spotify for the podcast. It's the Meat Mafia podcast. And we're also on Twitter. My handle is at Carney Clemenza. Again, the anonymous handle there. Mafia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Use your names. Yeah. Uh, and yours is uh, at Mr. Salazzo. Yeah. And then also YouTube as well. We, we, we've we been putting a lot of uh, investment into just like the audio video awesome. quality of the podcast. So if you just, you know, go you, Meat Mafia podcast on YouTube. It's all there. And then we also have a sub stack too, where we do a, a weekly newsletter as well. And just throw in recommendations for local farms and recipes awesome. and just how you can incorporate this lifestyle and make it more fun. Yes. But um, so appreciative you having us on, man. This was so much fun. Yeah, it was very fun. I'm sure we'll run it back again in the future. And I look forward to watching this brand grow. You guys have got something really special here. It's a special, it's a special combination of duo. Your insights are great. I love the energy. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep spreading this message. Fam, thank you very much for joining us. Make sure you check out the Meat Mafia. Go check out their podcast. It's excellent. We'll see you next time. Peace out, guys. Thanks. All right, friends. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Radical Health Radio. We got a fresh new podcast for you every Wednesday. If you enjoyed the show, consider liking, subscribing, reviewing, and rating us on your podcast platform. It helps to spread this message of radical health. We'll see you next week.